Hello, everyone. I'm Marvin Thomas. I'm a heritage planning and policy advisor with the Heritage Conservation Branch at the Ministry of Parks, Culture and Sport. And welcome to you all to our first day of our winter webinar series. Now, before beginning, I acknowledge that Regina, where I'm located, is in Treaty 4 territory, traditional lands of the Cree, Nakota, Dakota, Lakota, and Anishinaabe, and homeland of the Métis. And wherever you are, I encourage you to reflect on the deep connections Indigenous people have to those lands. Thank you very much. So in these webinars, uh, we'll be hearing about several Saskatchewan heritage projects that involve different kinds of historic places that were done for different purposes and are located in a variety of communities of all sizes. And collectively, they illustrate a diversity of benefits that can come. Excuse me one moment there. I was just saying that all of these projects illustrate many of the benefits that can come from conserving and engaging with historic places. My is just where it was very glad. Like, how would anybody know about this? And it's like, well, I'll you tell me every year. And it went to group two, it was on the agenda, and it was posted. Just ask people to maybe keep their microphones muted until we. Uh, Begin, begin the webinar and some of the uh, discussion. But I was about to say, glad to hear about these projects from people who have first-hand knowledge of them, and they can tell us what it took to make them happen and what some of the results have been. So today, there'll be three presentations that show how heritage resources can be valuable tourism resources. Uh, before I introduce the first project, I'll again just uh, remind our guests to keep their microphones and cameras turned off during the presentations. And I'll also remind our presenters of our tight schedules. If everyone stays on time, there should be time for questions at the end of the hour. So I'll ask everyone to hold your questions until then. But you can also put questions into the chat as you think of them as we go along, if you would like to. So our first presenters are going to be Teresa and Scott Reeser, owners and operators of the historic Reeser Ranch, an award-winning guest ranch and provincial heritage property in the Cypress Hills. And uh, Scott and Teresa, I'll just set up your uh, slideshow here as I get ready to turn things over to you. And that should be up on everybody's screens momentarily. <coughs> So Scott and Teresa, the floor is yours. Howdy. Today. I guess our mic is unmuted. Yeah, we hear you. So uh, thanks for joining us today as we share a bit of our life journey with you. We hope to encourage dialogue and awareness to promote heritage tourism. Before getting into details, we would like to mention that th there are numerous people and organizations that have been instrumental in guiding, shaping, and encouraging us on this journey. Our children, our families, our Cypress Hills community, Tourism Saskatchewan, Royce Pettyjohn, Marilyn Williams, Saskatchewan Heritage Conservation Branch, Cypress Hills Interprovincial Park, and the Cypress Hills Grasslands Tourism Destination Area. We are thankful to uh, all those who have encouraged us and or challenged us because it has helped us to grow and to become who we are today. Heritage tourism is a catalyst for heritage conservation. Every time a heritage building is protected from demolition by being re repurposed for a new use, a chain of events happens and a domino effect comes into play for the community and the building that it's located in. There are economic, cultural, and social benefits for conserving uh, buildings and what we've done here at the ranch as a his historic heritage tourism destination. We will discuss each of these points individually. So the first one is the economic benefits. Uh, provides a source of employment for ourselves. Generates tourism dollars into Cypress County in Alberta and RM111 Maple Creek Visitors spend uh, their tourism dollars at local tourism attractions in the Cypress Hills area, which is more than 200 square miles in radius. 
Fuel, meals, entry to activities and other accommodations keep visitors in the area spending their tourism dollars. <clears throat> we employ lo local residents and young people from across the country, um, as far as Quebec, have come and, and helped us out um, with programs, work projects and work experience. Cultural <clears throat> benefits. We help share the story with visitors that is integral to Saskatchewan and Western Canadian history, that of hopeful pioneers settling in the West to start a new and a better life for themselves and their families. The ranching and farming industry in Western Canada is the backbone of our economy. The su sustainable practices that have been passed down through our previous generations continue to this day, promising long-term viability for our future generations. By preserving and showcasing our history, we demonstrate a sense of pride, a sense of place for our community and visitors, showcasing where we have come from, where we are today, and where we are going. So next, uh, social benefits. Being a multi-generational ranch operation, the family's roots are deep within the community. The Reeser family has always participated as members of community boards for social functions, educational boards, stock associations, sports associations, and even on history book committees. We have 15 bedrooms in our old log barn rental facility that are named and dedicated to Pioneer Ranch. Sorry? Oh, somebody's... Um... You are unmuted. Okay, but oh, I'm muted. You? No, we hear uh, you. I think you're just getting a little feedback. It should be fine. I've okay. got so many. I've gone. I've done the go to meeting. I've got the webinar thing, and I have with my iPad. That's what I use. I don't use my computer. I use my iPad. Yeah. And it works mm -hmm. really good. I listened to the whole CWL meeting here a couple. Is that right? Yeah. But this is so complicated. You know, like I don't know, and I don't <laughs> know why it had. When I was talking to Lance, and I was telling him, he says, "Well, why wouldn't they simply put it on Facebook or something?" So that you could easily access it from any computer. It's almost, he says, like a webinar. You can bring it in the room. There, sorry there for the interruption, Teresa. It took me a while to find the uh, person who was speaking so I could mute them there. Please don't okay. you to, uh, go ahead. No worries, okay. Uh, so we have uh, 15 bedrooms in our old log barn rental facility that are named and dedicated to pioneer ranch families from the Cypress Hills area sharing their histories with, with written stories, photos, and keepsakes on the walls helps keep their family names preserved. Involvement in social events such as dances, baby showers, weddings, work-related activities such as cattle roundups and brandings have always been key to keeping a healthy connection between neighbours and community. We always like to tell our visitors that it's just not about the research and that's we've really enjoyed sharing the stories of all the uh, the local ranchers in the area. And we're proud to showcase the uh, history of the area because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. So um, Marvin, this is your cue for showing, um, starting our, our photo slides. <clears throat> Are you there? Uh oh, did we lose Marvin? Oh, there he is, okay. Good job, Marvin. <laughs> so. One of the uh, things that we do at the ranch here is we allow people to participate in horse activities. And uh, there's a picture of our uh, guest string going out for uh, some grass after a day of work, I guess. And there's, uh, of course, the ranch house in the background. Next. <laughs> so here we have our, our new photo merge. Uh, credits to photographer Jolaine Nicole Rayner from Medicine Hat. Uh, she was up for the challenge of doing this for us. It was um, a vision that we'd had um, a number of years ago, uh, a tribute to the family. So we've got um, actually here a 1919 photo on the left of the house. Uh, Scott's dad is actually the little guy on his mom's knee. Uh, on the front of the uh, deck there. And then there's friends from the Sarnia Ranch that are visiting that day from down at Walsh. And then of course, Sorry, the right is, is We're not seeing your photos. Oh, uh oh, 
Marvin, are you some there? Pe some people are. I was just putting a note in the chat too. If you're not seeing the photos, try logging in a, uh, with a different browser if you're able to, or perhaps download the uh, Teams app. I think it's a browser issue because some people, most people, I think, are seeing them. Mm -hmm. There could okay. be another issue uh, if you click on the ellipses and, and scroll down to focus on content. Um, you should be able to, some folks might be successful in finding the pictures that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope they can see them. Uh, so what was I saying? Oh, yes, the picture um, on the right is our family, our immediate family uh, with the provincial heritage plaque uh, in, 19, in 2019. So this uh, this is about a hundred year merge of uh, of this uh, of the house. So next, Marvin. Uh, you're supposed to oh, do I'm sorry. No, nope. back though. again, back again. Sorry. <laughs> so this, um, and I have to say, we uh, we spoke to Royce Petty John about uh, writing a tribute for us, for the family, and, and he was very kind in doing that, and so I'm going to share it. Uh, tribute to the Reeser family, honoring our forefathers and celebrating our Western Canadian ranching industry. The native prairie sweeping across the north slope of the Cypress Hills owes its resilience to root systems that extend deep into the earth where life-giving moisture sustains its grasses. These grasses have in turn sustained the area's ranching industry for, for well over a century and attracted the Reeser family to put down their roots in the beautiful Cypress Hills. For more than 120 years, generation after generation of the Reeser family have served as stewards of the grasslands stretching across the family ranch. Today, the sixth generation invite guests to share in their family's connection to these ranch lands with their own brand of cowboy comfort and Western hospitality. In 2017, the historic WD and Alice Reeser Ranch became the first ranch in the province to be designated as a provincial heritage historic site commemorating the role that the ranching industry has played in the development of Saskatchewan. This photo merge is a celebration of the deep roots the Reeser family have in this special place and the unbroken continuity of care the family has given to their ranch and historic ranch house. The family extends their deepest thanks to their many friends, neighbors and visitors for sharing in this journey with them. Thanks again, Royce. Next, Marvin. For anybody that can see this, uh, this is a picture of the uh, original house uh, 1906 there was another house uh, or some kind of a shack that they lived in prior to that log uh, structure log yeah. structure but this uh, 1906 house was uh, partially encased in the uh, house that was built in 1916. next so here we have the um, 1916 house uh, that uh, is on the very spot that the 1906 house was built on, uh, built for two families uh, by A.B. Hillman and crew of seven carpenters from Calgary, Alberta, using cordless tools. And um, they didn't have batteries on them either. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, built for the two families, Scott's great grandparents on the left side and his grandparents on the right, uh, two living rooms, two kitchens, um, a den, just beautiful home, uh, but the upstairs all open to the six bedrooms. So uh, next, Marvin. <clears throat> so this uh, picture is of the bunk house, which is one of the uh, buildings that we had designated. It is the building on the left, the uh, lower building. And there's a picture of my uh, great grandmother and a friend that was visiting. And uh, back then they had wolfhounds, and that's one of them uh, mm -hmm. in the picture there. And I uh, can't see all your faces, but uh, there's some turkeys in that picture as well, just like you rest of these turkeys, if I could see all your faces <laughs> on the screen. Uh-huh. So that was 19, circa 1920. And so next photo, Marvin. So this here is the bunkhouse today. Uh, the same position as what you saw in the old photo. Uh, but of course, it's been um, renovated for uh, the, as a rental for guests. There's a big log deck there for um, sitting out on, and that was built by our son and the folks there enjoying the campfire. 
Next, Marvin. So that's this is the picture in front of the uh, old log barn. And there's a picture of some uh, cowboys and, and or cowgirls that are uh, heading off to do something. Mm -hmm. That is my dad, who is the uh, third from the right. Probably about 12 years old, circa 1925. Next, Marvin. Okay, so front of the log barn today, present day, the um, lots goes on in this building. We have 15 bedrooms in this uh, uh, facility for guests. It's great for family reunions and um, all kinds of functions. Big kitchen, big games room, uh, fire pit out back. It's a, a great place for gatherings. Next, Marvin. <laughs> So that's uh, an aerial photo that was taken of the old log barn. And of course, on the left, on the end of the barn is uh, our ranch hall facility where we serve guests uh, meals. Mm -hmm. And uh, that picture was taken 2020 when we were hosting the children's wish ride and uh, all them cowboys and cowgirls got their horses all lined up there. And mm -hmm. Next, Marvin. So I'm not sure how we're doing for time, Marvin, but you better keep track with us here. This um, this is the last of the, the, the 10. Uh, the plaque that sits proudly out in front of the barn today of the um, our provincial heritage property. And I won't read it, but because um, I know we're short on time here, but we're gonna carry on now with uh, a few photos that with activities at the ranch that to be enjoyed. And you can go to our website at reserranch.com to to get a uh, better idea of all that you can do here. And so yeah. as you scroll through these, Marvin, Scott's going to do the old home place. Of, uh, that was uh, one on. of the things that we do after mealtimes is uh, we share cowboy poetry. And this is a poem that was written by my mother uh, in appreciation to her folks for her, uh, for her childhood home, which is located about 10 miles from here. There are memories of my childhood that time will not erase, of good times and of bad times too, back on the old home place. It lies hidden in a valley in the dear old Cypress Hills. The Indians likely camp there to escape the winter's chills. The hills and the trees surround it. They break the fury of the wind. They must have camped there often while their buffalo they skinned. There are many Indian cellars, teepee rings, and heads of arrows to be found along the Six Mile Creek by the crossings and the narrows. I've tramped along the creek banks and I've waited in the summer. I've listened to the flicker call or sat and watched the drummer. I love the old home place down there where I spent my childhood years. There one could feel so close to God and tell him all their hopes and fears. In those carefree days of childhood, the folks didn't have much money and both of them worked awfully hard, but you know, it's sort of funny. We had more than lots of other kids. Love, time, and peace were ours. There was space to grow in and the birds and trees and flowers. We also had the home we loved and there's not one of the seven who doesn't feel way down inside that was pretty close to heaven. I could sit beside the rushing spring in warm and sunny weather and watch the thirsty horses drink with their smell of sweat and leather. I can close my eyes and see it all, the log house in the coulee, the corrals, the barn, the water trough, I will tell you folks quite truly. So all may go our separate ways as we compete in life's long race. We may never find the peace we had back on the old home place. There are memories of my childhood that time will not erase, of good times and of bad times too, back on the old home place. So I hope that made you go drifting back down the trail to your childhood stamping grounds. And that's the end of our presentation. And we went a bit over, but you other um. people interrupted us. <laughs> I think you're doing just fine on time there. We always hope these things will go smoothly without technological glitches, but uh, they do happen. So thank you everyone for bearing with us. And thanks uh, Scott and Teresa for sharing the story of your ranch and 
some various different aspects of different types of heritage that it represents there. We really appreciate that. So I'll just introduce our next uh, project here, which is going to answer the question, what can you do with a surplus engineering work? Uh, Jennifer Fitzpatrick, Director of Cultural Services for the City of Humboldt is going to tell us about a creative repurposing of the Humboldt Water Tower. Um, Jennifer? All right, thank you very much. So I just want to confirm that you can see those slides and you can hear me. I can and I do. And I Perfect. Hope everyone else does. All right, so thank you very much for inviting me to share the story of the Humboldt Water Tower. I just want to begin by acknowledging that I am on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. I pay my respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm my relationship with them today and, and moving forward. So the Humboldt Water Tower story is a story of passionate volunteers. It's a story of community perseverance. And I just want to start by recognizing all the wonderful work of the many, many volunteers that have worked on this project and, and really turned this into a fantastic wonderful tourism attraction. And similar to the previous presentation, there's a lot of people to thank, so I won't have time to thank everybody, but um, just know that this is a real community project. So just to give you some context, uh, Humboldt became a village in 1905, a town in 1907, and by the time the building of the water tower happened, the population was about 1,500 people. So they were having a tough time getting a, an adequate source of water. And so the town council at the time just decided to spend $300,000 to build a water tower to ensure a stable supply. So the engineering firm of Chipman and Power out of Toronto was hired to construct the tower. It's a standpipe reservoir water tower. So obviously the height of the tank provides the pressure for the, the delivery system. And there are about 10 of these built in the province. So it was the main source of water for the community beginning in 1915. The water source changed um, between Burton Lake and Stony Lake north and south of the community. So the tank capacity was about 156,000 gallons or you metric people 800,000 liters. Um, there are seven tiers of concrete at the base that increase in diameter as they go down into the ground. The, uh, the exterior of the structure is 25 feet in diameter and approximately 95 feet tall. The interior tank itself is about 20 feet in diameter. And so the water tower really served the community well um, until about 1977. Um, obviously, there was a new water treatment system established and really the employee at the time turned off the lights, closed the door and it was left to sit there. And so it was, although it was designated in 1985 as a municipal heritage property, there really had not been a lot of work done to the tower. And so by 1996, town council had decided uh, due to some safety concerns, vandalism, that type of thing, that that the designation would be repealed and that it would be uh, torn down and, and actually burnt down. And I think it's important to see the type of shape that this thing was in, um, you know, and then it really speaks to the uh, enthusiasm of the volunteers. So when that information was provided publicly that this was the intent, uh, there was a Friends of the Water Tower Committee that came together and they got a six month reprieve to kind of figure out, you know, from council to figure out what to do with the tower. And when you read through the newspaper articles of those community meetings, I think it's really important, it's connection to our topic today of heritage tourism, is it was one thing to consider, you know, what, how to conserve a tower and how to keep it, but it's quite another to consider how are you going to use the tower what is going to be the use? What's the new use that you can find for the tower? And I think it was really those decisions early on by this group of dedicated volunteers that really have changed the tower into what it is today and a fantastic uh, tourism um, attraction. So this group gets together and they do some tough work. I mean, honestly, when you kind of look at these images, 
So as you can imagine, this tower had been sitting empty for 20 years. Um, this is what they lovingly called the poop patrol. Uh, you had um, years and years of pigeon droppings to clean up. And the photo on the left is the space between the tank itself and the external wooden structure. And that uh, the, the top of the tank could only be accessed by this series of ladders and platforms in this small space. So a lot of really hard work um, at, the, at the onset. Um, but besides from the actual physical work that they were doing at the tower, they were also publicizing the, the plight of the tower. They were looking for donations and sponsorships. They were contacting you know, everybody they could to kind of you know, gather community support. They started doing fundraising events and really just a lot of work to kind of establish that, that core group and the core funding to kind of move the project forward. They were also really doing a lot of work to plan about the future of the tower. And I think this is really part of the real success story of, of the water tower. So by 2002, it was decided that it would be redesignated as municipal heritage property. And also they, they, they got uh, Coffin Engineering out of Saskatoon. These are plans that were done in about 2004 and 2006 to really answer that question of what is the tower going to be used for and why are we going to, why are we going to save this and what is the new use? So they got some plans together um, and they really started to continue their work. So work included around the foundation. So this is the top level of the uh, concrete, concrete foundation being worked on. They had to stabilize the roof um, was one of the first things they did. They had to build a dormer to access the roof. And just a note, uh, Mike LaBelle of Western Restoration from Manitoba did a lot of the work on the tower and really became a really good friend and a supporter of the work. Oh, work was also done on the annex. And part of that, part of that answer to the why and what's the new use is part of the designs were we're going to build an internal staircase. And I think this is part of the brilliance of, of this, this specific project is that that was determined to be the new purpose and certainly something that was um, really thoughtful and and um, really far reaching for the committee and and uh, so this is the staircase design by Cochrane Engineering uh, to put in that to put in that staircase. So engineered um, by Cochrane, um, they did hire journeyman welderman welders um, when necessary to do the work. Um, but still a lot of work of very skilled local volunteers. And as you can see, you know, years and years of, of work. The last step was installed in 11, but there was still a lot of work to be done. And so these volunteers really committed their time to put in this staircase, really make sure that it was uh, it was well put in. Um, and all of a sudden, and all, obviously um, water tanks don't normally have lights, so a lot of electrical work needed to be done and really a lot of work to repurpose this. So just some fantastic work by the committee. The other thing that needed to be done, uh, the observation deck up at the top was reworked. And a lot of exterior work. So they did um, try to keep as much of the original siding as they could. So they repaired and replaced um, where they where, where it was necessary. And I think one of the volunteers described this um, exterior work as a butterfly emerging from a, from a cocoon. And so I'll just kind of share with you some of the slides that I believe is that's a really apt description of kind of this metamorphosis. So you can see, you know, the exterior had been had been restored. The tower is looking fantastic. They're moving forward. Um, and one of the uh, the other really important things they needed to consider was how does this how does this water tower now function as a tourist attraction? And so the municipal um, insurance people got involved. Um, we needed to look at how tourists would work in the space, how they would tour the building how many people would be allowed and that type of thing. And these these were not easy projects to undertake. The, the committee had already put a put a man sized hole, obviously for people to walk into the tank. But one of the insurance um, requirements was that we put in a, a second exit. And so the committee really worked hard in those last few years to ensure that all the 
safety things were ready for tourists because they were really driving toward the goal, which was this, which was in 2015, the 100th anniversary celebration of the water tower. And so they were they managed to get everything done on time and really were really excited to open up the uh, the tower, you know, more broadly to the community. So at that event, um, you know, the volunteers were thanked. Norman Dewar, who was instrumental in putting this committee together and, and really raising the awareness of the tower, uh, spoke. And you'll see uh, up across the bottom a lot of those core volunteers who did that work on the tower. And, and you know, this is a lot for a lot of these people. This is over a 20 year commitment. And so just the, the community was there to thank uh, the, the, com the committee and, and the volunteers who had done so much work on the tower. So at that time, the tower was turned back to the municipality to run um, to run the kind of the tourist operations out of there. Um, my staff did a lot of um, videos with those volunteers just so that we make sure we have that knowledge about the tower and um, and can share that with the community going forward. 2016 was the first uh, summer of tours. So you can see that um, it's very comfortable. This is one of my summer students uh, doing tours. You can see it's quite comfortable up at the top. Um, this talks about similar to um, the previous presentation about the cultural benefits. We share the stories, whether that's the interpretation. These are the, the arrows of the overflow tanks. We talk about why there's windows in a, in a water tower. Um, when people come into the space, they tour through the annex area. So we talk about the filtration tanks and the softener system that you see here. The committee has installed stained glass windows. But really, people are coming to the top for the best view of the city. So this is one of those views that you can see um, whether no matter if you're young or old, um, people really enjoy spending a lot of time up at the top. You can see a great image of the city. But how many steps does it take for you to get to the top? Well, it takes about 143. And this is one of the fascinating things that the water tower community did as well is they they have sold um, $500 um, steps. So you can purchase a step in the staircase of honor, have your have your name on the steps. And as as we tour people up, these these plaques are really easy to read. We do stop at the landings along the way. I always encourage my really young summer students to pace themselves, you know, according to the people who they're touring with, to make sure you stop along the way. And people love to read these along the way. For programming, we obviously do work around the theme of water. So whether it's a fish pond, uh, we have our local fire department will come over a lot of times for our events. We give out free bubbles. This is the best place in the in the city to blow bubbles from the top of the water tower. We run tour programs. There's a beautiful green space beside the tower, so we can have you know people can sit there and have picnic lunches and and then go up for their tour of the tower. This is really cool. One of our local teachers has a um, has created Aurora Man and Aurora Man actually lives in the tower. So it's a great way to connect to local pop culture. Uh, the, the water tower has become very, um, very sought after for rentals for wedding photos, um, whether they're up at the top or along that staircase. Um, people love to take wedding pictures. This is the actual internal staircase. This is one of the most photographed things in our community as well. So you can see the beauty um, of this internal staircase. So overall, I think, you know, it's similar to, you know, when we talk about economic benefits for the tower, for the community, um, heritage benefits, we get to share the story about this. And, um, and so it's really become a great tourist attraction for the city of Humboldt. Um, so we charge $5 for people to go, for adults to go up the uh, tower. Um, we are we continue to fundraise obviously because we are working toward we know that we'll need to do a paint job again in the next few years so we're putting money away from that so um, this is one of only four towers that are still remaining in Saskatchewan and certainly um, the only one I would argue that has such a beautiful and uh, unique use in Saskatchewan so thank you very much thank you Jennifer Thanks for uh, sharing the story of the amazing job the community has done there, created a, a unique tourism resource. So uh, Jennifer will be staying till the end of the hour, as will Scott and Teresa for people who have questions. So at this point, I will just go ahead and introduce our third speaker. I think Jennifer, you're still sharing your screen.
our next uh, project has is blended tangible and intangible elements of Saskatchewan heritage to create a very popular tourism experience. So to tell us about the Southern Prairie Railway, I'll introduce Carol Peterson, Mayor of the Town of Ogabaw and Chairperson of the Ogabaw Heritage Railway Association. And Carol, I will turn it over to you. Guam Territory Board, the same as uh, Regina is. And uh, I just wanna explain a little bit about the Southern Prairie Railway as part of Ogamaw Heritage Railway Association. Our missions and vision statement are to promote the history of the train and its ties to settling Saskatchewan, and also to build a sustainable operating railway museum that showcases Southern Saskatchewan's diversity. So basically, what we do is uh, people come to Ogama and we show them how the people, the settlers came here um, to settle Saskatchewan. And then we also tie in with the uh, Deep South Pioneer Museum, which is located in Ogama as well, which has over 33 buildings that are full of artifacts. We have over a million artifacts. And so uh, they can go on the train, see how the settlers got here, and then they go to the museum and they see how they worked, played, went to school, that sort of thing. So the inside of this schoolroom uh, is exactly the same as it was back in the day. Uh, a lot of it said in the early 1920s, the church is the church. We've had a wedding in there, a small wedding. Uh, the farmhouse has all the farmhouse stuff in it. So it gives you a feel of uh, the going back in time. Uh, we have a lot of people that uh, really enjoy it because it's uh, um, not uh, cordoned off or anything like that. It's all out for everybody to see. Uh, we um, are one of the few places in Saskatchewan or maybe a lot of places in Canada even that have uh, two museums in our town. We're about 383 as of our census last year. So we're a small population, but we have two uh, charitable nonprofit museums in town here. So the train idea started back in 1998. Uh, we have a annual fair day. It's the second Saturday in July and uh, Sunday is the museum day. So they kind of hinge together and uh, we decided we needed something else to do. And we had a train uh, a railway that went right through Okama and we thought, gee, we could use that maybe for a train type theme and we could do something different for fair day, not realizing how long it would take to get everything done. Our uh, train station was at the end of Main Street, but in the 1960s, it was moved off. And so we um, wanted to make sure that we had the train station where people could uh, stop at. And so we found one in Saskatchewan and Simpson that was exactly the same as ours. And the fellow there had saved it and was using it as uh, grain storage. So we traded three bins for it and we moved it to Ogama in 2003 in two pieces. Uh, it took, uh, uh, two days to move it and uh, cost over six thousand dollars just for SAS power to raise the uh, power line so we could get it down here. Simpsons north of Regina about 125 kilometers. We're south of Regina about 125 kilometers on Highway 13 between Weyburn and Assiniboia. So we moved the train station there. We set it down and uh, we started renovating it. We uh, cleaned it all up. We painted it and scraped it and there's a small CPR park right beside it. So we uh, landscaped that. For a fundraiser, we uh, sold uh, trees there that were already there and uh, they were a thousand dollars each. And then we put plaques there for whoever wanted to put their family name on them. We also had benches that we sold for a thousand dollars each and uh, family names were put on them as well. So it was a good fundraiser to get some of that done. So once we had the train station, we had it up and running for 2005. And um, it was uh, Saskatchewan Centennial and it was also Okamaw's homecoming. So we had all that uh, ready to, for everyone to see. And so we got a lot of people and a lot of interest on that. So once we had the train station, we decided we needed the train. So we looked around and we found a 1945-44 tonner in uh, North Conway, New Hampshire. And, uh, oh, thank you, Marvin. There's a picture of our train. Yeah, I'm just sharing a few things from your website, Carol, as you speak. I appreciate it. Um, and so uh, we found the engine. It's a 1945-44 tonner. It's a push-pull engine. It was being used as a yard engine there and they were no longer using it. 
And so we uh, bought it and uh, the passenger car we found in uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, it's a Pullman, 1922 Pullman car. It has walkover seats so that uh, when uh, we don't have any turnaround, so when the train unhooks on for one end, once we get out to horizon, it goes around on the siding, goes on to the other end and hooks up. And we just flip all the seats so nobody's riding backwards because nobody likes to ride backwards. So you can see there, there's the elevator. Some of our tours go out to Horizon and uh, the, some go to Pang in the other direction. So it's about 45 minutes either way. Uh, we have the Heritage Tour. We go out to Horizon. We um, talk about how the elevator functions and uh, it's a 1922 elevator that's there that's still standing. We have seven working elevators on our line. So we're 117 kilometers here. It's a uh, um, it hauls producer cars during the week. So we run on the weekends and uh, we go from June until September. We have a lot of different uh, uh, trains. We have the Kids Fun Train, that's very popular. We started out with it and uh, we started with one a month and then it upped it to uh, uh, 10 in total because they sold out quite quickly. We do uh, food trains uh, such as the Pitchfork Fondue. We uh, do the Settler's Supper, the Texas style barbecue, the Rum Runner, and all this is at Horizon at uh, their community center there. It's a decommissioned Roman Catholic church. And um, we pay to use the church, so it helps them with uh, fundraising. Uh, we pay for everybody that goes into the elevator, so it helps with some of the expenses there. We uh, pay for everybody that rides on the rail line. We pay that to Redcoat Road and Rail. It's a short line. It's one of the 13 short lines in Saskatchewan. And uh, we have tried different trains that didn't work. The Starlight Tour, the all day train, the Sunday morning train, they just didn't work. So we just switched them up. Uh, the Craft Beer train was very popular. I think we're gonna try that again this year. And uh, Christmas in September, because we only run from June until September, because we don't have any heat, uh, we tried Christmas in September and that was very good. Um, so some of the positive outcomes are uh, we uh, are a joint venture with the two neighboring villages. So it helps uh, Pangman when they do a farmer's market there, they have the farmer's market. So we go out there and people can go to the farmer's market. It isn't very big, but it, does help the locals there. Uh, it, it has increased tourism for our town. Uh, it's nice to see a lot of people from all over the world that are in our town. And we have a lot of other things around town that uh, are heritage. We have a, a walking tour of Main Street and we have a firewall or had a firewall and a fire hall. Uh, in last year, our fire wall went down. It was 80 feet long. It was one of the two remaining firewalls in Saskatchewan that was brick, it was over 100 years old, and the wind on January 19th last year knocked it down. So we're in the process of uh, putting up a plaque there with a monument so that uh, people can remember that uh, it was there and uh, what it did for the town. Uh, it has increased the jobs around the for the summer jobs, so uh, some of the younger people can uh, work there. It's nice to have something different to do. It has increased the visitors to the museum as well because each of our tickets uh, get you into the museum for free. So it's a joint venture with the museum. So again, they can come see how the settlers got there and then they can go to the museum and see what they did there. Um, Okama has won um, municipal uh, provincial, national, and international heritage conservation awards. Uh, we're quite proud of all these as we're not very big. We went to Dongguan, China to present our community to the uh, world. There was 50 communities there. We were the smallest ones there. I was talking to the representative from Ireland and um, she was talking about all the different issues that they had. And I said, well, you know, you have the same issues as us because we're talking about water and sewer and heritage and all that sort of thing, housing. And I said, you just have more houses than us. And she says, well, how big are you? And at that time we were 308. And she says, 308,000? I said, no, 308. Uh, we're now 382, so we're a lot uh, bigger now. <laughs> but uh, 
we were the smallest community there, the 50 communities that were presenting, and uh, we won the Heritage Conservation. So basically, we were less than 100 years old at that time, and uh, we won Heritage Conservation. Because what happens at the museum is uh, when a building on Main Street is uh, basically decommissioned and not being used anymore, it's taken out to the museum and we use it out there. That's how we got the 33 buildings out there. This year, the museum is celebrating its 45th anniversary, so there's lots of heritage out there. Uh, we have a large Filipino community in our uh, community here. It, over half of our school is uh, Filipino now. And uh, we have a lot of different um, jobs for them. One of the things is the tourism, of course, and uh, we try and incorporate a lot of things. We found that if, as long as you ask them uh, to the different events that they join in with us. So it works out really good. Um, we have a small governing board. We're very fortunate that two of our members are um, in their 30s. So they're quite gung ho about all this tech stuff. I should have let him do that today. <laughs> uh, we also have a, um, on our board with uh, just the six members, the two are the younger ones. Uh, we also have one from each of the neighboring communities. So we have a very uh, diverse board that really helps a lot with all the things. The thing with our project was uh, we started in 1998 and of course it's taken quite a few years to get it going in 2012 when it was Ogama's 100th anniversary is when we had our grand opening and that's when our train tour started. And so we've been going every year since then and increasing uh, visitors each year, except for 2020, we didn't run at all. But last year we cut back on some of our train runs. We didn't do a lot of the specials, but we still had 60% capacity. So we still did well. So basically that's how uh, Southern Prairie Railway got started and how it uh, affects uh, Okama and the surrounding community. I'd like to thank you, Marvin, for all your help, too. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Carol, for coming and telling us about it and for so deftly adjusting on the fly like you were able to do there. <laughs> Hopefully we're able to show enough photos to whet people's appetites so that now they yes. can go and see it for themselves. So uh, Yeah, if you go on to southernprairierailway.ca, it's all on there and you can also book from there. So it's quite easy to go on there and use that website. So. Okay, great. Well, uh, certainly invite questions for anyone, for Carol or for Jennifer or Scott. We do have a few minutes uh, still at this point, so uh, feel free to put something in the chat or to uh, raise your hand using the uh, little icon there. I uh, see a few things coming in here. Uh, let me just look in the chat. There's a question. Would we be able to get a copy of the webinar? We hope to post recordings of them to our ministry website. I'm not quite sure the date they will be available, but uh, I can uh, circulate the uh, links out to you when, when those are available. And uh, do you see somebody, Peggy has a question? Go ahead, Peggy, you're, uh, there you go. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. <laughs> yeah, you're good now. Thank you. Uh, it was really a question for, I think, Jennifer uh, from Humboldt, right? Um, and I can't hear you, by the way. <laughs> um, it was a question about, I wasn't clear about the relationship between uh, the water tower and the city's administration. Uh, 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 is it a separate organization that runs the tours or is it tourism or it, it's that sort of thing? It's that relationship. Okay, we had all these volunteers. The wonderful work that Norm Dewar did was incredible and, and all his volunteers. Um, but then we have this facility which is all done already for the public beautifully done tremendous amount of work but then it's the operation of that and i don't i wasn't clear about how that worked and how much the city was involved in that 
because we have been involved with stuff in Saskatoon. You repair something, you bring it up, wonderful. And then what happens, right? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for the question, Peggy. So for sure, the water tower was saved by uh, that group of volunteers. Um, the city did provide funding throughout the years, but really the bulk of the work for that for that restoration and rehabilitation was um, through that volunteer committee. And then after the uh, anniversary, the committee decided that they would like to give that back to to the city to operate. Right. So then it became part of my department, which is the Department of Cultural Services. So I run a museum, a gallery, the Water Tower, Original Humboldt Public Art. So my staff and, and the summer students actually provide the, um, the tour programs. We, we run the tower as an operational thing. Any donations, for example, we're still selling those steps. Any donations and that are specifically put into a reserve specifically for the water tower um, so that, that that work can you know be done. So the fundraising stays with them. The city provides the staff um, and that type of thing to make sure that we have the, um, the capacity to run the tour program throughout the year. Okay. okay. Oh, well, thank you. So it's really a city run facility. It certainly is, but we do have we do have that water tower committee and we do have, you know, um, we do still have people from those original volunteers on our committee to help us. As you can imagine, there are many idiosyncrasies of running a water tower. And so, uh -huh. we're really, yeah, we're really excited to still have those volunteers with us that we can consult. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I, you know, meet with them on a regular basis. OK, all right. So there's no funding or anything for the board or the committee, uh, there's not a formal relationship between the committee and the city of Humboldt. Oh, for sure there is. So there's it's a, a for, form, it's a formal sort of agreement or something. Yes, yes. So there's a there's a formal terms of reference for the Humboldt Water Tower Committee, which okay. reports to the to the board that I work for. So they report to the board, and then it's all done through municipal administration and right up to city council. Okay. okay. Right. We still do have time to get in a couple Thank you. Of quick ones here. I see one more question in the chat right now. And actually, this could be to any or all of you, I guess. And it's actually a pretty big question, but maybe you could just touch on it very briefly. Some someone is wondering what your marketing strategies might be for any local, provincial, national or international tourists. Does anybody have a brief comment on that they would like to make? I can answer a little bit on that. What we do is uh, we join up with Tourism Saskatchewan and uh, they have a bit of funding for it. So uh, it helps us to expand our uh, tourism dollars. We go into the South Saskatchewan uh, guide every year and uh, the odd time we'll go into prairies north uh, it covers a lot of saskatchewan and you see it in a lot of uh, doctors offices and that type of thing and uh, we've also gone into the caa uh, magazine in both alberta and manitoba so that's what we do as well as uh, anytime we get to speak about our community uh, we do that okay thanks carol uh, Either of the others uh, wish to uh, make a comment. I do see another question coming. Brigitte, Brigitte. So if I can jump in here. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Scott. So tourism, Saskatchewan, but then we uh, buy ads and or do other things that we think might work for us. And if things don't work for us and they don't work for us and they go away. <laughs> That's how it works. But uh, for the international, uh, market definitely tourism Saskatchewan has some really good people there that really uh, um, promote us and and so we're very thankful for them that they're the key international ones but like Scott says we do over the years we've tried many different venues or you know different publications and you just go with what the best um, the best results and of course the web internet is so amazing for opening the the world to us so right and we get lots of word of mouth mm -hmm. that's always that's always some of the best promotion for sure so, uh brigitte we could squeeze one more quick question in the dwyer probably there 
I just wanted to uh, put a plug in that um, I work for uh, the Francophone Affairs branch with Parks, Culture and Sport, and we uh, translate the Sask Tourism Guide to French every year. So in case uh, some of the uh, some of you presenters might not be aware of that, uh, the guide is uh, as long as it's uh, provided to us from SAS Tourism, but they've been really good at doing that every year. So uh, just so just so you know, and I guess I'll just say I really want to get to that water tower and the rail station. I've been to the Risa Ranch and it's just awesome. Just we loved it. We booked a evening dinner. We stayed overnight and uh, a ride and yeah, it's great. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. So that pretty well brings us to the end of the webinar. There's one last comment in the chat here that, that I will second. It says so many great things to see in Saskatchewan. Thank you all for taking such pride in your projects for the work you do and sharing your wonderful work today. And I'll second that with a big thank you to all our presenters as well as to all the all the attendees who joined us today. Uh, some of you will be coming back for other webinars in the series on Thursday. We'll be uh, hearing about uh, historic buildings redeveloped for business occupancy on Tuesday. We'll see some projects that have broad community benefits. And the final webinar on March 10th has an archaeological theme, including a presentation on ground penetrating radar. And there still are some late registrations available. Uh, I put the contact information for that in the chat, which I'll leave open for a few minutes after we leave the meeting here. But uh, I'll just say again, thank you and hope to see some of you back and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was our pleasure. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.